Hi, my name's Mercedes. Welcome to Highlands Online. If it's your first time joining us or you're a regular at Highlands, it's so great to have you. Welcome. We'd love to hear from you on our Instagram, Facebook, or via our website if you have any questions or prayer requests, or you just want to say hi. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Countercultural is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I think we need it as Christians to be countercultural, but the world needs us to be countercultural. Honestly, it does. It needs the church to rise up. And what's the church? The church is just you and I. It needs to be people who will go out of their way to make a difference in the world, who'll take the Great Commission seriously. And the Great Commission, Matthew 28, is probably the best one, but it says, Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, teach them the things that I commanded you. It's a really interesting commission we're given to go and make a difference in the world. You read through different versions of the Great Commission and there's miracles. There's the power of God coming, healing coming. And I think that's what culture is desperately needing and why the church needs to be countercultural. Because culture's a mess. Society's a mess. It's reality it is. You look out there, you look at the news today and go, wow, society's a mess. When you've got a president being shot at, you go, Really? When you've got people who, who are just that fixated on their point of view that they're willing to take a shot at somebody. A, a culture's a mess, and, and Australian culture's a mess, but culture is destroying people's lives. And this is what the experts say, psychology today. Judging by the increased rates of depression and other mental health problems, it's clear we're dealing with a cultural epidemic. It's cultural because it's based on popular beliefs, I think that's a really interesting statement, popular beliefs. It's clear that we're dealing with a cultural, or rather, it is reinforced through human interaction and gets transmitted. Don't you love their, their words here? Transmitted through social media, celebrityism, mediocrity, and excess independence. As we'll see, what these, all these variants have in common is, they de- um, is that they derive from and reinforced a distorted sense of mattering. Some people suffer from humiliation. They feel like they do not matter. While others experience hubris, they have an inflated sense of personal worth. And that's just really what we see, isn't it? We see social media starting to drive culture because social media is driving culture today. We all know it. We all experience it. If you're on social media, you get fed the things you want to hear and you get fed the things they want want you to hear. There's two parts to it, isn't it? As a church, we use social media. We put the message of Jesus out there. And we want people to hear that. Uh, But we know that it's going to get to people who want to hear it. Social media is transmitting culture to the world we live in. That's why we need to be culturally different on social media and in every aspect of our life. See, society has a view of Christianity. And it's getting fed through the media channels. And this is what that it is. It's a, a view that we are legal, we have laws, we're, we're religious, we're hypocrisy, we're bigotry. That's how we're, we're viewed. And, and it's so easy for us just to accept that and become a cultural Christian and withdraw back into our shells and go, oh, well, that's what the world thinks. And cultural Christianity, I think, is a curse to the church. It's saying one thing and doing another. Now, we're all guilty of that, aren't we? Reality, at times. You know, we do lie. If your wife says, does my uh, look big in this? What's the answer? (laughs) Wisdom. Wisdom. But the reality is a lie. No, it's not. Sorry, (laughs) Dale. I'm in trouble now, aren't I? This is what you call big trouble. <laughs> but you see, we, we get caught up in hypocrisy. We get caught up in the challenges of society. And we accept it and we, we, we start to live out of that societal view. We live in a time when people are looking at for truth and they're looking for authenticity and they're looking for identity. Truth, authenticity and identity. That's what people are looking for. 
And the church, we should be showing that out. We should be putting out truth. Now, truth is not truth without grace. It's a balance of grace and truth. It's not just, ah, well, this is it. You're going to hell. No, no, no. There's a balance of grace and truth. And it's not all just grace. Oh, you'll be all right. Don't worry. She'll be right, mate. You'll just slide into heaven. No, no, no. There's got to be a, a balance between grace and truth. But how do we demonstrate truth in love? How do we actually show it? You see, the social construct of the world today is you can choose what's truth. Your truth is your truth. And you're not allowed to have an opinion against that because it's your truth. And a culture, we're in actually a culture war. That's the reality of our world. We're in this culture war. And that's why it's so important that we're countercultural. See, the adage out there in the world is the church is irrelevant and it's dying. That's what the world thinks. When you go out there and talk to society, you talk to media, they go, the church is dying. But it's not true. It's not true. So there, um, there was a survey done in 2021 by NCLS. And this is what they said about young adults today. They've experienced much growth in faith. They're fully confident their local church could achieve what it set out to do. They would support the development of new initiatives of their church. Their gifts and their skills are encouraged to be to the great extent by the leadership of the church. They have leadership or ministry roles at the local church and they want to be more involved. That's actually what the survey says. The world says, hey, the church is dying, but the surveys and the truth says, actually, church is growing. You think about our church, you see the growth of our church, you know, we've got this, this um, survey done, and you can pick it up at the info point, and it was done by McCrindle, so McCrindle's a, a, a well-known organisation in Australia, and we are the, actually we found out on Thursday, we're the only church that's done this in Australia, and what we did, because we, we have an adage in this place that if we're not the best, how do we become the best? The problem with that statement is that everyone focuses on the word best when actually the word is become. That's what we're interested in. How, what are we becoming? And if you live in the bubble of church and, you know, as staff here and we live in this bubble and you think, oh man, this place is amazing. And I think it is. And I'm totally biased. So we got the outside world to actually have a look at it and actually tell us about what we're actually, what we're actually like and they, they had a look at our church, they had a look at our school, and they had a look at our early learning centre. And interestingly, they named it, now this is their name, not our name, Impacting Lives and Building Community. Isn't that a great name? Isn't that what we want to do as a church? Isn't that how we want to influence culture? That's actually how we're countercultural. And we see that the church is growing. If you look in the, in the, the booklet, you'll see that Highlands Church to Grey, in 2013, we had 417 people. Average weekly attendance. Average weekly attendance last year was 1,064. I think the church is growing. I think it's growing. We had 322 people give their life to Jesus last year. Uh, The church is growing. And I think the world wants to paint a different picture because they actually don't want people to know that the church is growing. They don't want the people to know that the church is making it. And it's happening across the world. We're seeing it happen across the world. There's, there's revivals all across the world going on where people are getting saved. We had Vietnam here last week. They're all our churches in Vietnam, 93 churches, 10,000 plus people. In Vietnam, the church has only been out from underground for five years. You go across to the Middle East, we actually, at that conference, there was, we had a guy preaching. We were in our uh, INC 50-year conference last week. Was it last week? week before. I get lost in time. Uh, uh, and we're there, and, and Sammy Rodriguez is the preacher there. Now, he's a guy from America, but he's, uh, he, he's prayed for the presidents of the United States. So he actually prays for the pre- presidents of the United States at their inaugurations and declares the name of Jesus over them, which caused a whole pile of problems. But that's a good thing to have cause a problem because it's countercultural. They didn't want him to say the name of Jesus. They just wanted him to be a blessing. Can you just bless them? And he said, the name of Jesus. But he said in our conference, hey, if you're under 30, stand up in this place. And all of a sudden, heaps of people stood up and you could see the expression on his face going, oh, wow, that's not what I expected. 
There's something happening in our generation and our youth in our generation. There's something happening, revival happening across the world. And we are part of it. You are part of it. We sing the songs, but it's actually, it's about to happen. I really believe it's about to happen in our world. But our mission is about making a difference rather than religion. We're not about religion. And Jesus made a few strong comments about it. Don't you love Jesus' language? I love Jesus' language sometimes because he gets really to the... And you can, we type of read this now and go, well, that's you know, pretty tame. But in those days, that would have been shocking that he said this. He said, he said, you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, that's pretty strong words. He's speaking to the religious people of the day, the Pharisees of the day. He speak, they're the religious ones. He's saying you're a brood of vipers. But what I think is really interesting in this, and it's, why it's interesting for us as the church, because he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the heart here is called iscardia in the Greek. And what it means is our most innermost being. It means what's deep within our souls. That's what she's talking about. Out of what's deep in your souls. See, that's cultural Christianity is, is when you get in there and there's, it's nothing in there. But what have you got in your soul? What have you got that's coming out? What are you speaking out? What's coming out of you? Because I actually think we've got to have the living word of God come out of us. We've got to see it come and touch lives. The, the identified the main issue here is an issue of the heart. And I think it's the key issue we face today is the issue of our heart. It's the issue of our heart. Now let's have a look at this because I want to go to Galatians tonight. And Galatians is a passage of scripture around being cultural Christians and also being Christians that make a difference in the world. And this is what it says in Galatians 5. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Not only, uh, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for this flesh, but, ser- love, but through love serve one another. For all ha- the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let me stop there for a minute. <clears throat> you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's an interesting passage. And we, we tend to gloss over it because we want to get to the next bit, but how are you going loving yourself? How's your heart? How do you love yourself? And you say, oh, well, it's not about loving myself. No, 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 it is. It is. Because how we love ourselves is how we treat others. In your relationships, how you love yourself, how you're dealing with your own life reflects in how you relate to others in your, your marital relationships, in your, your romantic relationships. How you love yourself is how... You, see, if you've got issues of the heart, you love through those issues. And that reflects in the other people. And we're going to get to a little bit about this because actually the heart is where the war's over. But do you love yourself? Because I think it's a really big deal. When you go back up to where we were at the start of this service and you look at people go, some people suffer from humiliation because they don't think they matter. And then that's how they treat others because they don't matter or they get walked over. And that's never what we're called to be. Never what we're called to be. But if you devour one another, be it beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts after the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do, that, so that you do not th- do the things you wish. We are body, soul, and spirit. That's what we are. So catch that in, in context here. Understand... There's a war going on between your flesh and the Spirit of God for your soul. That's what's happening. That's the cultural war we're in. That's the spiritual war we're in. There's this war going on for your soul. Your soul. And we have to understand it. So 
The word for flesh here is sarex. It's your body, your human nature with all its desires and pleasures. That's what the, the word flesh is. What's your flesh? It's your body. And, you know, we've got these unhealthy desires sometimes, don't we? we uh, let, if it feels good, do it. That's the type of cultural norm today. If it feels good, do it. But we know, if you've been around for a little while, just because it feels good and you do it, actually sometimes doesn't end up in a good position. It ends up in a mess sometimes. Uh, even when you think about it in context of, oh, well, if God wants me to have a new car, he'll give me a loan. No, no, the bank will give you a loan. The bank wants to give you a loan at a really high interest rate. It's not God. And all of a sudden, oh, praise the Lord. Look, I got a loan to get a car. It's my, ah, oh, if it feels good, do it. You know what I found about new cars? After the first day, they're not new. And you might park it in a car park a long way away, but after a month, you park it to the closest car park. But it's in all those things. If it feels good, do it. But it's not. There's a war going on for your soul, and that's your flesh. That's your instant gratification. I want it, and I want it now. The instant gratification, it's not a delayed gratification, an instant gratification. We see it in relationships, you see it in sexual relationships today, where people want the instant gratification. Oh, well, if you really love me. I just want to address that to people tonight. If you really love them, you'll wait. Oh, but the culture says, no, no, if it feels good, do it. I want to check it out first and make sure it's Okay. You only lose your virginity once. Why don't you think about it? You only lose your virginity once. Choose who you give it to. Choose wisely. The reality of Scripture says it's a covenant. That's what people don't understand about marriage. It's a covenant relationship. The breaking of a hynum. It's actually a blood covenant. Well, let's hit the real issues. People go really quiet when I talk about this stuff. Funny, hey? But it's true. It's true. The world says, oh, have as many sexual partners as you like. I've got to deal with it later as a pastor as I work through the issues you're facing. Honestly, we do. And people go, oh, well, the world says it's okay. It's not. It's not. God gives us boundaries because there's a battle going on for your soul. A, I can tell you a story. I remember this, um, this couple came and visited a pastor friend of mine. No, it was a woman, actually. Sorry. Let me get the story right. She came to visit a pastor friend of mine. Uh, and she came into the office and she said, all for the last couple of weeks, I've just been crying. I can't work it out. I just cry. I'll be in the shopping center and I'll cry. I'll be at home and I cry. I'll be at work and I cry. And they're praying for her saying, what is it? And she goes, it's like grief. I've got this, it's like I'm just grieving. And the pastor's sitting there and uh, praying for her and the, the pastor's wife had this word of knowledge and said, what happened to your husband? She said, I don't know, we got divorced 20 years ago. I don't even know where he is. She said, can you find out? So she literally, they stopped and she went out and she made some phone calls to some friends. And when she started to grieve was the day her husband passed away. You see, it's a covenant. It's a covenant. It's powerful. Culture says, no, no, it's okay. She'll be right. Social media says, hey, it'll be okay. But it's not. There's an epidemic of porn and it destroys lives. They went, to, they went to do a study on porn. They wanted to do a study of men who hadn't experienced porn and a study of men who had experienced porn. They couldn't find enough people who hadn't experienced porn to do an equal study. The culture we live in today. There's a war going on for your soul, friend. There's a war going on for your soul. It's time for the church to actually get out and say, hold on a tick. Hold on a tick. 
There's a cultural war going on. It's reality. People don't like it. People want to go and do everything they want to do. But I can tell you what, it's much better if you don't. Much better if you don't. That wasn't in my notes, that was free. <laughs> See, the war, the war going on, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. That scripture, the word lust is, uh, it's a Greek word, it's all Greek to me, epo, uh, epitomio, epi, epitomio, I've got it spelt phonetic, phonetically here, but it means what you set your heart on to covet or desire. So you see you've got this, your innermost being, your human nature, and then you've got the word lust is set your heart on the covenant desire and the spirit is numerous, it's the spirit of God and it's warring, the flesh is warring against the spirit of God for your soul. There is a battle going on culturally and spiritually for your soul. That's why it's important that we're countercultural. The spirit of God is countercultural to our human nature but it's desperately what we need. The Spirit of God is countercultural to our human nature, but it's desperately what we need. See, culture is a strong part of people's lives. It influences their views, their values, their humour, their hopes, their loyalties, their worries, and their fears. That's what culture does to you gets inside of you, changes you. I think about how culture's changed over the years. I've lived long enough to see cultural change. I've lived long enough to what would, is normal now was disgusting years ago, unheard of. People would go to jail for. That's the war going on. It's trying to desensitize our soul that we accept it. And it's time for the church, you and I, to make a difference in the world. How do we do that? You see, it's not that we yell. Yelling at culture won't reach it. Putting a placard up, having social media rants, being a keyboard warrior does not make the difference. Serving a generation makes the difference. That's why frogs is important. We get and we serve a generation. It's why the doors are open to us at university because we don't go in there with a placard saying, you're going to hell. We go in there and we serve a generation. We go in there and give them solutions to the problems. Just let me say this. If you've lost your virginity and you're not married, God's a God of restoration. Let me tell you another story. We have a good friend of ours. She's actually one of our intercessors. She prays for us regularly. She was a young girl who ended up having a child out of marriage. Fella left her. She was left as a single mum. Was in our church in Sydney and she was praying for a husband and there was a guy in our church a lot younger than her and uh, they got married. And her prayer was, Father, I'd like my virginity back. When they got married, she had her virginity back. Miracle. There was a blood covenant between them. But God's a God of restoration. There's no condemnation. It's really important to understand that. Yelling at yourself does not fix yourself. Yelling at yourself does not fix yourself. And sometimes I think we yell at ourselves. And that's the humiliation. We go where we started. We talked about hubris and hum humiliation. Yelling at ourselves. Look at my problems. I've got all these problems. Now love yourself. Yelling at yourself doesn't fix it. But Scripture gives us some keys to unlock our identity. Romans 12 says, renew your mind. Do not conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Psalm 23 says, he'll lead you beside still waters to restore your soul. Because understand, there's a war going on for the soul. There's a war between your flesh and the Spirit of God for the soul. But God says, he leads you beside still waters to restore your soul. To make new your soul. Psalm 51 
David's crying out, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast miracle. In other words, give me a creative miracle. I've messed my life up. Creating me a new heart. A creative miracle. So no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, God's in the restoration business, not the condemnation business. But the world is after you. There's a really good book. If you're interested in good books to read. It's this book, The Anxious Generation. This is what it says. How the great rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. Hadiet, the author, argues there's a direct line between, the direct tie between the wide distribution of smartphones and the rise of depression, anxiety, and loneliness, loneliness between young people. See, what we see on offering culture through these devices can seem like a really good thing. But there is an actual statistical evidence that it's bad for us. Go figure. And we're seeing depression, anxiety, mental health and loneliness come out of it. We live in the loneliest time ever, yet we're the most connected ever. We live in the loneliest time ever, yet we're the most connected ever. So sad, hey? Galatians 5 says this, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and it sounds like the world we live in today, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, Sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of worth, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice things, these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Provoking envy sounds a lot like social media to me. Comparison, complaining, condemning. And we use social media, it's okay. <laughs> but if you let it get to affect you, if it gets inside of you, it can create a lot of problems. So what advice does Scripture give us about it? A few scriptures here. Romans 8 tells us there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. 1 John 3.20 lets us know that if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. And John 3.17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In Psalm 34.22, it got as far as to say, the Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. To wrap up tonight, I want you to think about loneliness for a moment. KPMG commissioned a report on loneliness that says this. There's economic impacts, costs Australia economy, health, mental, annual health care costs to Australian economy is $2.7 billion. Mental health issues closely related to loneliness, including depression, are estimated to cost the economy up to 60 billion annually. That's just the monetary cost. But have a listen to these statistics from that report. Loneliness experienced by more than one quarter of Australians, and most Australians will experience loneliness in their lifetime. 37% of young people are lonely. Loneliness is a silent killer. Lonely people have a 20%, 6% increase in the risk of death. The impacts of loneliness are evident to uh, equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes today or having six alcoholic drinks per day. 54% of people are lonelier after COVID-19 pandemic. The church is an antidote to that. Who we are. I think about our model of church. If you're around Highlands, our model of church is this. Discipleship community worship discipleship is being a good friend 
if I can frame it down to the simplest term, it's just be a good friend, walking alongside someone, loving them, pointing towards Jesus, inviting him into community. And what's community? Community is small group. Community is where you hear Andre talking about praying for people and seeing miracles. Community is where we love, where we love each other, where we learn, we learn about God, we learn about our situation, and where we do, where we make a difference. So I hear sometimes the church saying, the church should. The church should do this. We're the church. We're the church. So if you think the church should, go and do something about it. Grab half a dozen people, create a small group, see Brendan, see Andre and say, hey, we're going to go and make a difference. Discipleship, community, worship. What's worship? It's where we come together in nights like tonight, encounter the presence of God. Be life, see our lives change as we encounter God. See, the answer that it that the culture exposes is the lack of freedom. But they expose it as freedom. Whatever you want to identify as, whatever your heart desires. But it's not what the truth is. So if you go back to that scripture in Galatians, it talks about love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control. And really, that's what the world's looking for. They're looking for love and joy. They're looking for freedom. The funny thing is, we've got the answer to that. That's why we need to be countercultural and go about our daily lives making a difference in the world. You see, the difference speaks louder than the words we say. When people look at us, they go, what is it about you? There's something about you. It's the difference. It's the difference they notice. Preach the gospel always and use words if you have to. The difference. Jesus' answer is freedom. John 8, 34 puts it this way. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits a sin is a slave of sin. And a slave of sin does not abide in the house forever, but the son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. And that's the opportunity that's presented to you. If you're a Christian in this place, you should be able to have freedom. If you're not a Christian, the opportunity is for you to find freedom tonight. So let's pray. Father, thanks. Thanks. Thanks that you create a way with no condemnation. Thank you, Father, that you were countercultural, you are countercultural, you've always been countercultural. When Jesus came into the culture, he was countercultural, and the whole world took notice. When he commissioned 12 men, they were countercultural. The world noticed. And that's gone on for 2,000 years. And even today, the world notices. But Father, thank you that when we encounter you, we find freedom. When we have you in our lives, we find freedom. It's so easy to go to become a cultural Christian and lose the freedom. And Father, tonight, we choose to come back to you. We choose you. We take culture out of our life that de demands the idolatry of our soul. Where our flesh is warring with your spirit for the soul. Father, we choose tonight to choose you. Hey, just while every eye's closed, every head's bowed, maybe in this place, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never experienced this freedom we talk about. Maybe you've been in church all your life, but you've actually never said yes to Jesus. It's been a religious experience to you. you. You tick the religious box each week and saying, yeah, I've gone to church. I've done my religious duty. But then your week looks very different. Maybe tonight's your night. 
night to encounter the love, the touch from heaven, from a Father who loves you. I'd love to pray for you. The Bible says clearly in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, if you confess with your heart, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. There's two parts to it. There's a confession and a belief. One of the ways we show our belief is as simple as an outward expression of raising our hand and saying, God, I need you. So right now, I want to give you that opportunity. If you've never given your life to Jesus in this room, if you'd raise your hand and say, hey, I need you. God, I need you. I need you. As I look across this room, see that hand, awesome. That's so cool. Look across this room. Again, don't go home without him, friend. Right across this room right now, people say yes to Jesus. So good. So good. How about you? How about you? I don't want to join the church. You don't have to. It's not about joining a church. It's about joining with God, the church, the global church. Last time I'm asking tonight, I'll look across this room one more time. People say, why do you, why do you delay it? Because you matter. You matter to God. You matter to us. I just sense there's one more. I see the hand. That's so good. So good. Let's pray. If you raised your hand, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Even if you didn't raise your hand and you really wanted to, pray this prayer. It's a simple prayer, but a really powerful prayer. And the reason I pray it is so often we don't know how to pray. But the Bible said clearly, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. You believed in your heart by raising your hand. But now the confession of your mouth. And it goes a simple prayer like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Father, forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong. My sin. Father, I thank you that there's no condemnation. But Father, there's forgiveness and healing. Father, I thank you that you've become the Lord and Savior of my life tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If today's message did impact you and you gave your life to Jesus, we'd love to hear from you so we can help you take your next steps in your journey with Jesus. So please reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or via our website. We hope to see you again soon.